on kidney stones or nephrolithiasis. I'll be talking about the pathophysiology of kidney stones, how they form, which is related to the risk factors for kidney stones as well as the prevention methods. Next I'll talk about the signs and symptoms, or how kidney stones present in the clinic. Next I'll talk about the diagnosis, how to make sure you're actually looking at kidney stones. And lastly we'll talk about the treatment for kidney stones, whether a patient is treated in the inpatient or as an outpatient. Let's start with pathophysiology, risk factors, and prevention. First, pathophysiology. The formation of stones is essentially the precipitation of stones in the urinary tract because either of these things are happening, or both of them can be happening. Number one, the mineral, which is calcium, uric acid, or other minerals that we'll talk about later, can be in too high of a concentration. This is the solute being too, too high. There's too much stuff. Um, or the solute volume, or the solvent, can be in too low uh, volume. So you could have too little urine. So you can either have too much salt or too little water to dilute the salt. Either way, the concentration of the salt, whether it be calcium ions or uric acid or phosphate ions, is too high, and the stones precipitate in the urinary tract. Now there are several different kinds of stones. The most common are calcium stones, and we'll kind of go through them one by one, talk about how they form, uh, what foods they might be find in, uh, found in, and how to reduce your risk of, of getting those stones. So like I said, first is calcium stones. This is 80 to 85% of all stones. Um, the biggest category is calcium oxalate, which happens when you have acidic urine, such as in renal tubular acidosis. If you were to look at these under the microscope, they have an envelope shaped, uh, it's not very helpful in the clinic, but it's useful to know for pathology. To prevent calcium stones, you can do any number of things that I've listed down here, but you can also, uh, specifically for oxalate stones, reduce your intake of oxalate. Now this is a molecule that's found in peanuts, chocolate, and tea. The other type of calcium stone is calcium phosphate, and these uh, occur in basic urine. These are radiodense, meaning that they'll show up on x-ray, which is uh, pretty unique for stones. Only one or two types of stones show up on x-ray. Um, they all show up on CT, which we'll talk about later. Now, calcium phosphate is caused by overexcretion of calcium in the urine. So there are some diuretics that increase the risk, like furosemide increases the risk of calcium phosphate stones, whereas HCTZ, thiazide diuretics, decrease the risk of calcium phosphate stones. Calcium restriction increases the risk, and this is kind of an interesting mechanism. People think that if I eat less calcium, then I will get less calcium phosphate stones. It's actually the opposite. When you eat calcium, the calcium ions that you consume bind oxalate in the gut. So um, calcium can bind oxalate, and if oxalate is bound in the gut, it's less likely to be absorbed. Um, oxalate is more easily absorbed as an ion, and calcium kind of neutralizes it in the gut. So um, it's not true that calcium restriction prevents stones. Calcium restriction increases the risk, and patients should aim for a normal calcium intake, which is about 1,200 milligrams a day. Next is the uric acid stones. This is about 10% of all stones. These are flat, square, and radiolucent. Um, the interesting mechanism that's worth knowing for this is that they can result from cell death or cell injury. When a cell dies and breaks open, it releases a bunch of stuff like uh, LDH or purines. Purines is one of the molecules that's in nucleic acids. Now the purines are eventually converted to uric acid, which causes hyperuricemia, high uric acid in the blood, and uh, that can precipitate into uric acid stones. So if you've heard of tumor lysis syndrome, that's what's happening here. A bunch of cells are being killed, uh, maybe chemotherapy was used to destroy a tumor or a blood cancer, and all of this uric acid ends up in the blood and it can precipitate stones. There is a treatment for this. It's this medicine, rasburicase. Other ways to prevent uric acid stones are to give allopurinol. That's a medicine that's also used for gout. You can also limit animal proteins, the low purine diet. So that's also helpful for people with gout. It's kind of the same pathophysiology precipitation of gout crystals, whether it be in the joints in gout or in the kidneys in uric acid stones. I think beer also predisposes people to both uric acid stones and gout. Now you can alkalize the urine as well to prevent uric acid stones. So that would be getting your urine to a little bit higher than it normally would be, 6 to 6.5 with oral potassium citrate. That can help prevent stones. 
Next is struvite stones. These are about 5 to 10 percent of stones. These are the ones that form those massive staghorn calculi. This is when you have a massive stone in the renal pelvis that kind of takes up all the branches of the pelvis and it kind of looks like a staghorn. They're pretty big stones. These are precipitated by UTIs. So there are some bacteria with urease. This is the proteus, klebsiella, serratia, and pterobacter subspecies that can convert urea to ammonia. Now when they make ammonia, the ammonia in the um, urine can combine with magnesium and phosphate and make struvite. So struvite is this molecule right here. It's ammonium, uh, magnesium, and phosphate that combines with water. So that's how struvite stones form. They're associated with UTIs. The least common stone is the cysteine stones. This is only about 1%. They're hexagon in shape. These are pretty rare. They happen with genetic cystinuria, which is an autosomal recessive disease. You could prevent these by alkalizing the urine. So again, giving somebody potassium citrate or bicarbonate salt. And lastly, we have some general risk factors for all types of stones. In general, men get them more than women, and people with family histories of kidney stones are predisposed to getting them themselves. Uh, one risk factor is just somebody not drinking enough water. Um, you should be drinking enough water to produce at least two liters of urine a day. So staying hydrated definitely helps prevent all kinds of stones. There's this mechanism of fat malabsorption that leads to stones, and it's kind of similar to this calcium restriction that I mentioned earlier. But in general, there are diseases that prevent the absorption of fat. Uh, these diseases include Crohn's, small bowel disease, surgical resection, or chronic diarrhea. In these diseases, the calcium in your gut binds to the fat. Um, this is a process called saponification, you might remember from organic chemistry. So the calcium is binding the fat instead of oxalate. Usually calcium can bind oxalate as well. Now if all the calcium is taken up by binding fat, this oxalate is going to be an ion. And if oxalate is unbound, it's more freely absorbed, which means that oxalate gets into the blood and ends up getting excreted by the kidneys. If oxalate is being excreted by the kidneys, it's more likely to precipitate as calcium oxalate stones. So that's how the fat malabsorption can lead to nephrolithiasis. Same thing happens if you have impaired bile acid absorption. So if you have impaired bile acid absorption, uh, you're going to damage the colonic mucosa, which can increase oxalate absorption, and the same thing happens again. You end up excreting more ox uh, oxalates, and you end up having oxalate stones. Now, people who have had pre previous kidney stones themselves, they have about a 50% recurrence rate in the 5 to 10 years after that stone. So people that get stones are more likely to get more stones in the future. Next, let's talk about the signs and symptoms of kidney stones. Kidney stones primarily present with flank pain, which is demonstrated in this picture here. Now, flank pain of kidney stones is usually sudden onset and usually pretty severe. So people describe it as kind of coming out of nowhere, 0 to 100, really, really uh, quick, painful flank pain. Um, the pain can be colicky, which means it occurs in waves and it's intermittent. So they'll have like a wave of pain, sometime without pain, and then the pain will come back. The location of the pain is kind of demonstrated nicely here. It's below the rib cage to just above the pelvis. And some patients will describe it as radiating toward the groin, which kind of makes sense if you think about it. That's the path of the urinary tract. Um, the flank pain radiates to the groin. Now, why does this pain happen? It can be related to distension of the renal capsule, um, if the stone is still inside the kidney, or it could be related to ureteral spasms, if the stone has made its way down into the ureters. The other major sign of kidney stones is urinalysis in the clinic. So 90% of kidney stones present with hematuria. Now the hematuria might not be visible. The person might not come in saying, oh, I peed blood. It could be microscopic, but 90% have it. So that's pretty sensitive. Uh, if a person does not have positive blood on their urinalysis, stones are pretty unlikely. The other thing you might see on urinalysis is UTI um, indicators. So that would be pyuria, like a positive leukocyte esterase, or a bacteria that's positive nitrites. The pain that uh, kidney stones can cause might also induce nausea and vomiting, so that's, that's uh, common as well. You, if somebody comes in with these symptoms, you first want to rule out pyelonephritis. So you can check if they have a fever, um, check if they have white blood cell casts uh, in, their, in their urine. You also want to rule out renal cell carcinoma, so this would be a palpable mass that you can feel on the back, or uh, weight loss or other cancer symptoms like wasting. There's also this picture of obstructive uropathy that's worth knowing. This is a little more serious. 
uh, but if somebody has intermittent urine output, um, their urine might only be coming out when the stone that's blocking the ureters is so severely overloaded with uh, urine that the, that the urine can overcome the obstruction. These people are going to have very poor urine output um, if there is a mechanical uh, obstruction. And this might require like a urology consult. This isn't something you would deal with in the outpatient world. Next, let's look at how to diagnose kidney stones. So the first test you want to do, as we mentioned earlier, is the urinalysis. And uh, the vast majority of patients with kidney stones are going to have hematuria. could be microscopic hematuria. You can kind of reflex this with a urine culture if you suspect a UTI. So that's if they have the leukocyte esterase and the, and the nitrates. The next test you want to do is a non-contrast CT. This is the gold standard for imaging all stones. And all the types of stones that I mentioned earlier are going to be visible on the non-contrast CT. There's an example of that here where you can see the kidneys in this person's back. And you can see the stone is lighting up right there, right where the arrow is showing. Um, this is a three millimeter stone according to the caption and it's in the ureter here so it's, it's made its way out of the kidney and it's stuck in the ureter now the non-contrast ct is much better than x-rays x-rays only show some of the stones um, they don't show uric acid or cysteine stones so if a person is young or if a person is pregnant you don't want to do a non-contrast CT as your first test. You want to do a renal pelvic ultrasound, which isn't quite as sensitive, but it's safe in pregnancy. There are some other tests you could do in the context of kidney stones. These aren't as commonly done, um, but there might be some reasons you want to do them. If you check the serum, you could look for kidney function. Uh, that's looking at the creatinine and the BUN. Um, you might do this if you suspect that the renal parenchyma is damaged. You can also check the serum for calcium, phosphate, and uric acid, which um, might be very high in people that have those kinds of stones. If you suspect obstruction, you can use ultrasound, and this would let you see hydronephrosis or hydroureter. It doesn't have the best sensitivity for stones, uh, ultrasound itself, but the ultrasound is pretty good at seeing hydronephrosis, or essentially a blockage in the genitourinary tract. And as I mentioned earlier, this is an option for pregnant patients. There's this older test, intravenous pilogram. It's not really used anymore, so let's not worry about that one. Lastly, let's talk about the treatment for kidney stones. The, these things at the top you might do for almost all patients that have kidney stones. Um, so if they are dehydrated and you want to make sure they're drinking tons of water, um, orally or IV if they're inpatient, you want to keep them as hydrated as possible. This will help uh, pass the stone. This will help prevent future stones. You want to give them pain medications. Start with oral NSAIDs, and if it gets really bad, you can use IV opioids, um, but start with the NSAIDs. If you are giving them NSAIDs, make sure they have normal kidney function as well. You don't want to worsen their kidney damage by giving them NSAIDs. If you suspect UTI, so if you um, see pus in the urine or if you see leukocyte esterase, the nitrates, the same stuff on the urinalysis, you give them antibiotics for that. The rest of the treatment for kidney stones kind of is based on the size of the stones. If the stones are pretty small, like the uric acid stones we saw earlier, um, that's like less than five millimeters, those should pass spontaneously. You should definitely be able to manage those in the outpatient setting. And usually you can manage a stone of that size with just hydration, maybe pain medications if they need it. If the stone's a little bigger, five to seven millimeters, you'll add this medication, this alpha-1 blocker, tamsulosin. This will help um, reduce the muscle tone in the ureter, so it kind of decreases the intraureteral pressure and it helps the stone pass through. Nifedipine is another option for this, so that's a calcium channel blocker. If the stone is a little bigger, you might start con considering admission. Um, this is stone that's bigger than seven millimeters. This is when you want to do lithotripsy. Um, there's a picture of a lithotripsy machine here. That's essentially using sound waves to break down stones. So it's kind of cool. It focuses the sound waves on the stone to break them up and helps you pass smaller fragments. If the stone is really big, that's 1.2 to two centimeters, you might consider surgery. So this will definitely be an inpatient course. Um, during the surgery, you can do laparoscopic exploration. You could do a nephrostomy, you can even put in a stent. Um, here's uh, an, an example of an instrument in ultrasound stone uh, disintegration um, during a procedure there. There are a couple things that might make you want to contact urology that uh, you certainly wouldn't deal with in the outpatient world and in the inpatient world you might want to um, consult the experts. That's if you suspect urosepsis, so that would be like a fever, that would be sepsis signs, so probably low blood pressure, high heart rate. Um, that's can be caused by blockage of the GU tract. If an imaging study that you've done shows complete obstruction, that's concerning. 
If the labs that you've done show acute renal failure, like really, really high creatinines, really, really high BUNs, that's also concerning. If you've tried all these supportive measures for six weeks and the stone still hasn't passed, you can refer someone to a urologist as well. Again, some things that might make you want to admit the patient, uh, very large stones greater than one centimeter that won't pass spontaneously, pain that's not controlled with NSAIDs, people that aren't producing urine, and people that are predisposed to this are those with single kidneys, and people with UTIs, fever, pyelonephritis. Now, a helpful tip that I heard in the emergency room once is that the chances of a, of a person passing a stone depends on the size between 0 and 10 millimeters. So if there's a 1 millimeter stone, a person has a 90% chance of passing that spontaneously. If there's a 2 millimeter stone, a person has an 80% chance of passing that spontaneously. So there's that inverse relationship and that continues up to about 1 centimeter or 10 millimeters. So a 9 millimeter stone has a 10% chance of being passed spontaneously. So you can kind of say that a a stone that's one centimeter or greater won't pass spontaneously, and that person will need to be admitted for uh, this stuff, lithotripsy, surgery, um, interventions. Lastly, when the person does pass the stone, you want to strain the urine and keep the stone. The reason for this is that you'll later analyze the stone, and this can help you prevent recurrence. Now, if a person has one stone, they're one and done, they never get one again, you might not do this extensive metabolic evaluation. If a person has recurrent stones, if they've had at least two, you can do all, all sorts of things. You could look at their urine, 24-hour urine collection of calcium, citrate, creatinine, uh, uric acid, oxalate, pH, and sodium levels. You can find out exactly what kind of stone it is by analyzing the stone, and you can help them reduce their risk factors for getting another stone like that. In any case, you want to follow up with your patients in six weeks with a 24-hour urine to uh, see how they're doing, see what their chances are of getting stones again in the future. This has been a video on kidney stones. I hope it was helpful. Thank you for listening.